Hello everybody. Welcome to Introduction to Micromanufacturing with Lasers. Uh, my name is Ron Schaefer and I'm here to tell you about uh, using lasers to make products. First let me tell you a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Ron Schaefer. I'm Chief Executive Officer at Photo Machining. We are located in Pelham, New Hampshire. Um, I have a background in lasers and physical chemistry and uh, I teach and record uh, some webinars and I've been doing this for quite a few years. In addition to some of the laser work, uh, I also write for several publications. I've been involved with the, and I'm still involved with the Laser Institute of America. I uh, was on the board of directors. I'm affiliated with New, Eng New England Board of Higher Education. I am also on the editorial board of Industrial Laser Solutions where you can find my blog that gets done on a regular basis. If you go to www.industrial-lasers.com, uh, you can find the blogs there. And finally, I write a column for Micromanufacturing Magazine called Light Points. And this can be found online at www.micromanufacturing.com. So let me tell you a little bit about photo machining. Photo Machining is located in Pelham, New Hampshire. We're a laser job shop and systems integrator. Generally, we work with customers in the job shop to define a problem and to define some solutions to that problem. And then we either continue to manufacture those parts in our job shop or we build a custom laser-based system uh, that goes into a customer's manufacturing uh, environment. We have some sidelines. We do make poor ceramic vacuum chucks standard and also custom designs. And we have a sideline of refurbished uh, laboratory equipment. Uh, we have fairly high technical expertise and the company is about 25 people uh, as of January 2014. So the talk outline for today is as follows. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about the laser types that we use in micromanufacturing. We'll also talk about some of the markets and current trends in laser manufacturing. Then we'll talk about how to determine whether contract manufacturing or an in-house laser tool is right for your environment. And finally, we'll wrap it up. So, laser micromanufacturing. First, let's define that term. Uh, in my definition, the feature sizes are less than one millimeter and usually a lot less. The thickness of the material is also less than one millimeter and again, usually a lot less. Normally I talk about micro machining because that's what we do primarily here at Photo Machining and that involves material um, takeaway. So we drill holes, we cut, we remove material. However, micro manufacturing also includes other technologies such as joining applications, deposition and welding. Lasers can be used for all of these things. Lasers can also be used for marking. Uh, it does include lasers though, since it's laser micromanufacturing, all of these things I'm going to talk about are laser based. And finally, even though we talk about medical applications, we don't talk about surgical applications. Applications where the photon touch the human body or something different and that's not within the realm of what we're talking about here today. Okay, so why do we use lasers for material processing? First of all, lasers are non-contact. So you reduce the chance of damage both to your tool bits and also to the workpiece. No solvent chemicals are usually involved. Sometimes there's a cleaning process after the lasing, but usually there's no assist or anything except possibly gas assist. So you don't have to worry about disposing of and handling solvent chemicals. And in many cases, lasers are a one-step alternative to traditional etching techniques. Uh, we also have flexibility when we use lasers that flexibility in removing one material over another. If we set the right energy per pulse and we use the right wave wavelength, frequently we can remove one material and leave another material behind if that's necessary. And part of the other thing about flexibility is that lasers are easy to use. So we can, in many cases, do something in a very simple fashion. And of course, we hope that this uh, method goes into a production, but there are a lot of cases where lasers are used to do the initial work until you define a set of parameters that work, and then you can spend a lot of money to hard tool to do the particular job. Okay, so lasers. Lasers have a lot of different um, things that identify them, and we're gonna talk about a few of these. Pulse repetition rate. The pulse repetition rate is how many pulses per second the laser puts out. 
So for instance, if the laser puts out 100 pulses per second, it's a 100 hertz laser. If it puts out 1,000 pulses per second, it's a kilohertz laser. In addition, in all cases that I can think of, the pulses are evenly spaced. So the increment between the pulses is evenly spaced as some divider of the number of pulses per second. We can also talk about pulse length. The length of the pulse is the length of time that the light is actually coming out of the laser. Now for instance, a CW or continuous wave laser will have the light on all the time like a light bulb. But these lasers are really not used in most manufacturing environments except for perhaps welding. Most lasers that we use are pulsed. And the pulse length can go anywhere from, generally from with lasers, anywhere from microseconds or even milliseconds down to femtoseconds. It's the time that the laser pulses on. There's usually a rise time associated and also some sort of a fall time. The rise times are usually quite steep and the fall times usually have tails. In general, shorter pulses are better for micromachining, and in general, longer pulses are better for things like welding. So if we look at the pulse length effects from CW to ultra short pulse, USP means ultra short pulse, we find that on the CW side, we can see things like heating and melting uh, and a lot of thermal activity going on. Whereas if we go all the way to the other side where we look at the ultra short pulses, the pulses are so short that the photons interact with the material in such a way as to make at least the first order effects non-thermal. Okay, so we've discussed pulse length. Now let's talk about wavelength. The wavelength of the laser determines the laser's color, if you will. And all of the lasers that we use the color is somewhere between the infrared to the ultraviolet, so essentially centered around the visible portion of the spectrum. In the infrared portion of the spectrum, the infrared molecules or the infrared photons react with molecules by influencing the vibration rotation modes, and this in turn heats the molecules up. On the ultraviolet side, the photon energy is high enough so that chemical bond breaking can occur. With respect to wavelength, the longer the wavelength, the lower the photon energy, and the shorter the wavelength, the higher the photon energy. Okay, so now we've talked about pulse length and wavelength. The following chart shows pulse duration graphed against wavelength with the infrared uh, portion of the spectrum on the right hand side of the curve and the UV portion on the left hand side and on the y-axis short pulses going all the way to longer pulses and at the top of the graph CW which is continuous wave. If you look in the upper right hand side you'll see the red oblong and in that area we have infrared photons and either very long pulse length or CW which is the continuous wave as I said earlier. In that regime we have a lot of thermal input into the, the environment and that is very good for uh, basically for welding and in some cases for uh, very thick metal removal. If we go down to the lower, towards the origin, to the lower uh, pulse length and wavelength, we find that we have great micromachining capabilities because we have UV photons which give us the highest resolution and we also have femtosecond pulses which give us the best uh, processing quality. If we move along the x-axis toward the infrared, we can still do ablation and micromachining because even in the infrared with short enough pulses, we get very good micromachining capability. What you don't really see is anything happening in the short wavelength, long pulse length during the regime. Uh, in this regime, it's not really very useful to use UV photons because you're not really using them effectively. So there really are no good applications that use uh, at least in micromachining that use UV photons and CW or very long pulse width uh, lasers. So this concludes our brief look at the introduction to laser micromachining. Thank you for looking at this introduction. The next section will focus on the lasers themselves and we'll talk about lasers that are commonly used in the micromachining area 
including CO2 lasers, neodymium lasers, excimer lasers, and fiber lasers. Thank you very much.